Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Friday morning trading session. Uh, Friday before a holiday weekend. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I'm just getting the room opened up here. You can see I'm loading up my trade manager. And the market's just opened. It's a rather soft open, as you might expect, given that it's a holiday weekend. You can see here on the overnight, we had very little going on with the markets taking off pretty much from where they left off last night. The market looked like it closed here around the 44.92 area, and that's precisely where we're opening again. So no opening gap to deal with. I suspect today is going to be a little bit of a slow day. Um, two things usually happen on a Friday, especially a Friday before a holiday weekend. The traders either get really busy early out of the gate, get their business done, and go home, or they just don't show up. And um, either way, I think we can anticipate a market that's going to be more or less sideways today. And I see that Adam is in the room this morning. Adam from Indicator Warehouse. Where'd you go, Adam? <laughs> you're, you're, you're I'm here. here. Go. Oh, there you are. I, I, I like that, Adam from Indicator Warehouse. Y'all remember me? I, I'm the guy that owns the company, maybe? I don't know. I'm I'm the I'm, don't look behind the curtain right I'm the wizard behind the the screen anyway I just uh, I just happened to stop in today one I want to remind everybody that you know in case you don't know uh, markets are going to be closed um, on Monday at least the U S markets right um, and other than that I just stopped in to say hello like Eric said probably going to be a slow day today so uh, I hadn't stopped in and said hello to everybody in a while and um, I don't want to interrupt Eric, but if there's any questions y'all want to throw my way while I'm while I'm on today, you're you're more than welcome. Terrific. I'll see if I can think of any questions to stump you. <laughs> Absolutely. No, you cannot have a raise. Next one. <laughs> All right. So it does look like it's going to be a little bit uh, slow today. So, like Adam said, it's a good good time to ask questions. Uh, in fact. Uh, let me see if uh, I just got an email question from William, and let me see if William's in the room. Ah, William, you are in the room. Let me see if we can uh, find a scenario that will ha help answer William's question. William emailed me the other day, and he was looking at a, um, a Falcon trade. And you know what? We're just going to dial it back here a little bit uh, to the day before. And he was saying, what did I do wrong with this Falcon signal? I think this was it right here. It's, uh, he was looking at the YM, but it would be a comparable signal on the NQ. If this isn't the exact signal, it would look very similar to this. So what um, the William was looking at was he was looking at this trend change signal. Uh, he said, what did I do wrong? Why didn't this signal work out? Well, occasionally... The signals don't work out, unfortunately. Um, we've got uh, a trend change signal here. It's true. The trend line goes from red to green. We have our characteristic little up, down, up pattern. And then we get our buy signal. So what we normally do is we take our buy signal and we're going to run our stop a little bit deeper. And I'm going to show you why here in a moment. Uh, this was more prominent on the uh, YM than it was here on the NQ, but you see how we violated this previous swing low? And like I said, on the NQ, it's much more subtle. On the YM, this was a more pronounced swing low. And we ended up breaking that swing low. And what that ends up doing is it actually shows that the market is uh, retesting the lows, getting a little bit weaker. Now the buyers are making their, their final stand, if you will. So it looks like the buyers have control because now we have our buy pattern. And we go ahead and we buy the market right here. Okay, so now we're long. Now, the next couple of bars... Okay, well, I guess we actually end up going long here. Everything's well and good until all of a sudden the market starts to turn against us. Now it's, oh, you know, what do we do? We're on the wrong side of the trade. That's entirely possible. 
right? We don't know with 100% certainty, unfortunately, whether or not uh, the trade is going to work out. But knowing that there was strong support here, and how do I know there's strong support here? Well, because the market was supported here. And again, this was a little bit more obvious on the mini Dow. There's strong support here. There's obvious buying here. There's obvious buying right here, right? The market is come up, well, not super strong, but it was still a good move up. So the buyers aren't going to abandon this market entirely. So what we're looking for is we're looking for an opportunity to start to uh, protect our trade to look for the spot where the buyers are stepping in again. Well, this is that spot. And if we can get a couple of bars in our direction, this is usually the time where I say, okay, this is really the last chance for the buyers now. If the buyers don't recover the trend at this point, well, then what's going to happen is the market, see, it's working on a trend change signal to the downside. So at this point, I start to get more aggressive with my stops, especially if I saw a bar like this with this tall wick on it, big heavy bar. I would at the very least roll my stop around here around the primary resistance line below this little swing low. And then what would happen is the market would give me a trend change signal to the downside and stop me up. So this is what William was looking at, and he was saying, well, why didn't the trade work out? Now, William, you did everything right, except you didn't manage your stop correctly. William waited until you, he had the full stop out. The YM came down more dramatically. It looks like the NQ is bouncing around a little bit. But when you have an uptrend, when you have you know, the market trying to give you a downtrend signal and then come back with another buy signal, you did everything correct except you should have taken this opportunity here to roll your stop up and it would have cut your your loss approximately in half. All right, so it's not that you did anything incorrect other than you could have been a little bit more aggressive on managing your trade. So I hope you got that because you just saved me a whole bunch of typing if you did. Well, and your, your timing is good. I'm actually finishing up a blog post for Friday uh, talking about winners and losers you know, mm -hmm. with, a, with any system. Mm -hmm. uh, the title is Good Losses and Bad Wins. Mm -hmm. And so um, if, you know, I, I, I assume everyone in the room is on our mailing list and you get the weekly newsletter and, you know, so you'll, you'll get it. But just it's uh, something you look forward to, assuming I get it done before noon, which I think I will. Yeah. Good. Oh, William says he did roll uh, his stop. Well, then you did everything correct, William. You did everything correct. It was just one of those signals that, unfortunately, it's a high probability signal, but unfortunately did not work out. Uh, I'm just going to point out this green bar cell, and then I've got a question for Adam. Now, we've got a green bar cell, light. folks, and this is a little bit risky because if this market is going to be ranging today... Um, it may not actually pick up a trend, but we are kind of checking out the, the bottom end of the trading range. So, Adam, Floyd's asking about uh, the Ninja Trader 8 and if there's going to be a conflict with the, uh, with the DTS indicators or sure. indicator I'll, indicators. I'll answer that in one question. You know, again, thank you, William, for kind of bringing this topic to the forefront. I want to, uh, I want to address something real quick because... This is one of those um, one of those luxuries that we have that I think people overlook sometimes, and that is notice what Eric just he just explained the whole trade, and in William's defense, William did everything correctly, and the market still turned against him, and I cannot tell you how valuable that is. When I was starting out, sitting in my house with my you know six screens and obsessively watching the markets, if I had a bad trade. There was no one to tell me, you know what, you did everything right. You just That's the market. Sometimes you know, it's a probabilities game. Sometimes even if you do everything right, you're still going to miss. And, um, and what if, you know, I don't know about you folks, but that invariably led to me searching for another tool or another system. And um, you know, that's one of the advantages you all have now with this lifetime access to the trade room is having somebody just say, no, you did everything correctly. Don't beat yourself up. Um, the market just slapped you. 
And uh, I, I just can't tell you how valuable that is. So um, anyway, that's a little side note. So uh, Ninja Trader 8, the short kind of sassy answer is if you go to our home page uh, and you look at the top, you'll see there's a link that says something like Ninja Trader 8 upgrade or something like that. And it has a sorry about that. It has a long um, you know dissertation, if you will, of of where we're at with that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize it for you. Let me just turn off my sound real quick. Okay. Um, the, the gist of it is this, and, and, and I'm sorry that Ninja has not uh, marketed their software in the way I'm about to tell you, but this is the reality. Ninja Trader 8 is beta software, B-E-T-A. If you don't know what beta software means, Google it. Beta software means not ready for prime time. And it's become a... Um, a policy, a practice with software companies, really since Microsoft came online, to release beta software, meaning it's got bugs in it and it's not stable, to the general public, and then let the public, the general public, find the bugs for them, because it's more cost effective, right? And that's a lot of software companies do that. I mean, it's not I'm not knocking Ninja, but I cannot say strongly enough that it is not stable software, and therefore. Why in God's name would you risk your money using a tool that has not been proven to be stable yet? So that's from a customer perspective. From a vendor perspective like me, I've been down this road before. We were here when Ninja went from 6.5 to 7, and then from three months later from 7 to 7.3, and it was incredibly costly because every time we would try and get ahead of the ball and, and, and code for the, you know, in advance, they would change their code base because it was beta. And so our policy now is until the code base is stabilized, and that doesn't mean the day that Ninja Trader 8 comes out, because I promise you when Ninja Trader 8 comes out, you watch within the first three weeks to two months, there'll be 8.1, 8.2, 8.3. And when it is stabilized, then yes, I guarantee you, we will update our product line to work with that stable product and According to our policies, and we stand by it, those updates will be free of charge to you, right? So that's the good news, if you will. But please don't think you're going to trade any better just because there's new software coming out. It doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that you have to still put in the time, energy, and, and effort to, to learn the tools that you have today. And now I will step off of my soapbox and hand it back to Eric. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that, but you know, Adam, that makes perfect sense because um, I've got an old laptop that I play with uh, Linux uh, operating systems from time to time, and they're totally about letting the uh, the public debug their software. But of course, they're a bunch of computer geeks, so they love doing that sort of stuff. I yeah, I actually, I, I when I was first starting out, spending as much money as possible. Um, I got into a product called OmniTrader. Please don't jump over there. Don't waste your time. Anyways, OmniTrader, I spent about $10,000 with them. And their model, which I love, was um, you can pay, give us, give us dollars to pay for our development effort. Sure, why so, not? Right, and I was like, really? And I was a sucker. I dropped $6,000 on their, quote, uh, artificial intelligence engine. Hmm. which was a joke. Uh, so, you know, I, I just share that with you because, anyways, all right, it looks like there's a trade setting up, so I'm going to shut up. Yeah, it's it's not a quality trade. I'll point it out because we're in the uh, room here this morning and there's not much else going on. It's a green bar sell, but it's trying to work itself into a first micro-macro cross higher. So we're really in a position now where we could almost bracket this trade if we wanted. But honestly, it's not it's not a pretty trade. And there we go. Come on, get higher so I can delete this thing. <laughs> oh, Derek. Derek's in the room this morning. And Derek's always a bit of a cut up, too. Looks like we've got everybody showing up here this morning. <clears throat> yes, Derek, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Mohan... <laughs> This is kind of inside baseball. <laughs> I said, "Oh, I see. When, when, when we're all family, we're allowed to talk about this stuff." Yeah. Well, we're going to anyway. watch our video. Uh, let's let me see. Maybe Mohan's in the room this morning too. <laughs> yeah. Here's the party line on that, folks. Honestly, because you know, at the end of the day, we all have to remain professional. What I always tell people is, I learned a lot working with that 
uh, individual. And by that I mean to learn, I learned some of what to do and I learned a lot of what not to do. And so I think that's enough said right there. Mm -hmm. All right, so it looks like, well, shoot, the buyers are showing up here today. Um, we did get, I just missed this uh, hard edge buy here on the Raptor. But, yeah, there's not a lot of momentum, even though the volume seems to be fairly decent here. If you check the Geiger counter, the bar is a little bit thin, but the bid and ask is still there. So we're getting, um, we're getting some market participation. Well, we'll just hang out here for a little bit. I still think that maybe we're going to see something go sideways here this morning. Uh, gold. <laughs> Adam, you may want to just hit your mute button before you... Uh... Yeah, you know what? I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm not used to doing this stuff anymore, and I apologize. <laughs> you got allergies, I can tell. Yeah, Houston, <laughs> Texas, says, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I've done it too. I've missed the mute button and, and coughed in their ear too, so <clears throat> they're used to it. Uh, gold and crude also very sideways this morning. Um, getting a possible trend change signal here on gold to the downside. This would be with trend. So what we would be looking at here is this more or less has the shape of a bear flag, right? So out of this type of scenario, we do expect the market to continue lower from here. So we could set up the signal like this. I would definitely risk it above the swing high. You could also do a second push on this entry. And why would you want to do that? Well, you see the market bottomed out here. Then we had more buying right here. And look at where our entry falls. It falls, the hash mark falls right on the trend line. Now the signal is printed. If we can see the signal retreat a little bit, right now it's very neutral. That's why the, the bar has disappeared. It's dead center of the bar. But if we see the signal fade from the entry point, uh, it looks like it did try to fade at one point. What we're looking for is we're looking for renewed momentum to enter this market short. And it looks like we're going to try to get down here to the primary support line. And after that, we're down here to 1212, which would be a pretty big move, I think, for gold, given, you know, what we saw in the overnight, or at least uh, looks like about an hour or so before the open. A substantial move lower. See if we can't get down there to that break-even trigger. Nurse this trade along. We got a comparable signal on the eagle here for gold. This kind of gives you a, a bird's eye view, if you will. So the big move down, here's that bear flag type scenario. The hard edge bounce, and then we come out with our sell signal. So the eagle actually producing a signal a little bit earlier than what we got in the Falcon. And now we're just looking for a retest of the lows. This is where we're at right now. Sometimes after a, a big move, and it's hard to judge how big of a move this really is for, for gold right now. Sometimes after a move like this, the best the buyers will be able to muster is a sideways range. They may not actually be able to rally the market. Uh, we certainly got a scalp profit out of there. That might have been the way to go. And uh, we'll just put this one on the shelf, let it percolate a little bit. And I'll go back to the NQ, which seems to be on a bit of a tear now. So the NQ definitely uh, bullish. We did get a signal here on the Eagle as well, this hard edge bounce. And it looks like that would have been very, very close to our trend line. No, not quite. 
close, but the hard edge anyways. Whenever the market encounters the hard edge, we always anticipate some sort of reaction. I don't think we're to our profit target yet. Just challenging the top end of this trading range now. Uh, but yeah, we do have a little bit of a bullish flavor for sure. Ooh, Derek sharing a little bit of market gossip about uh, some of the other trading systems out there. This one fellow in particular, he says, uh, was showing 12 losers and two winners. He charges almost $5,000 for his, quote, best in the market software. All right, let me comment on that because William just asked me, I think it was William, his comment after us discussing all this was, um, you know, I'm not used to losing. Right, and I, I I think I just responded and it, to everyone in the group, but I want to share this with you because um, the best analogy I've come up with after now doing this five years is I liken trading to boxing. Right, you are going to get in the ring, you are going to get hit without a doubt, you are going to get hurt without a doubt, but it is the person who is best conditioned and best trained that will win in the end. So. If the expectation is to never have a losing trade, um, that's just simply a, not a rational expectation for day trading. Forget our stuff, anyone. And so it, it is the most psychologically challenging piece of trading you will ever overcome is dealing with losses. And, um, and don't let anyone tell you, Eric, you can dispute this if you want, that losses don't hurt. You know, you hear these people like emotionless trading. It's ridiculous. Losses do hurt. However, People like Eric have learned to take the pain and keep going. And that's the difference between a professional and a newbie is, you know, that you get knocked down, you just, you got to stand back up. And I will say the other piece of this is, and this is us, this is what makes us unique. If you do get hit with a loss, at least you're going into the ring with the confidence that you have a money management tool that is going to act as a protector for your account. So you will get a loss. But you already know that you're never going to lose more than a fixed percent of your account. And so that's your protector. That's your, that's your confidence when you go into a trade. Even if I get hit, who cares? I've got a money management system that's going to protect me and enable me to uh, continue to be profitable. That guy who had seven losses and two wins, let me tell you, if those seven losses were each for 200 bucks a piece and his two wins were for 2,000 bucks a piece, that's a profitable system. Go ahead and charge 5,000 for it. Right, and so, anyways, again, uh, you know, you guys may not invite me back in the room, but that's my other soapbox. So <laughs> well, no, it's true. <clears throat> it's true. We, you know, like you said, everybody's going to incur a loss. And here, I'll show you in a moment how you can uh, minimize, well, not minimize your l losses, but in increase your winning trades. And it's quite simply to um, adjust your profit objective. So if you're a little bit timid, if you're just getting started and you're, you're quite shy about uh, getting your, your profit objective, rather than hold out for the whole profit target, cut it in half. Now on the, or just go for a scalping target and everything. The market will almost always give you at least $50 on any of these signals. Uh, whether it be the eagle, the falcon, or the hawk. So if that's, uh, if that's a concern for you, if you really, really, really don't want to take any losses, even though, like Adam said, the losses are contained to a certain percentage of your trading capital, but if, you, if you're of the uh, psychological mindset that um, you don't want to take the loss, then just take a... A closer profit objective. You can see here the trade forecaster um, saying we're in full-on scalp mode. Oh, really? And uh, then we're going to come into trend mode in about 15 minutes' time, which will take us uh, through the top of the hour. And 
hopefully that will see the market smooth out a little bit. Right now, it's still very much in an uptrend, but we are at the top end of the uh, resistance. Like William says, we got, uh, or pardon me, Mo was pointing out, we've got uh, strong resistance here at 4503, which is our primary resistance line. And sure enough, we're seeing a little bit of a reaction there. Nothing I'm really going to sell, although I pointed this out to you the other day. If you suspect that the market is in a trading range, the DTS system isn't going to produce counter trend signals because it's been designed to pick up signals more in trend, although we are about to produce a double dot sell which is the counter trend signal for the Falcon. But you could simply throw in a limit order at the highs, a limit order to sell up here, a limit order to buy down here. Now, if you're going to do that, I strongly recommend you go with a scalp target. Just go with the 50 bucks. If the market hands you the $50, say thank you very much, get out and wait for another signal. The reason is twofold. First off, it's a counter trend trade. So the likelihood that the trade is going to have any significant follow through is remote. Uh, secondly, if you stay in a counter trend trade too long, it blocks you from taking a with trend signal when it develops. So you can see we're working on a trend change signal to the upside here with the Falcon. And if I shorted, say I shorted 4503, if I didn't take my scalp profit, which I would probably have already, or somewhere near the low of this bar, if this now turns around and becomes a buy signal, well, I'm already stuck on the short side, right? It makes it very, very difficult to turn around and uh, what do you do? Do you reverse your trade? Do you buy? Do you sell? Do you try to write out on the short side? What do you do? So it, it leads to more problems than it's worth. But like I said, if you suspect the market is in a sideways range, which I totally think we're looking at a sideways market today, go ahead, try to throw in a buy order at the bottom and throw in a sell order at the top and see if you can't sneak a couple dollars out of the market. Um, William's asking, can I see your crude oil falcon? And uh, here's a question for you, uh, Adam. Um, Derek was asking about uh, William in Bangkok. If he's uh, yeah, still I, doing I, I addressed, or... I addressed that. That's an that's an offline question. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, took care of that one. Although I do have, um, well, I've got you know one kind of selfish question and then one for the group. So uh, if you guys are open to this, it, you, you should know by now. Anyone that's been working with us for a while, I, I don't do anything anymore. Um, without the unanimous, not unanimous, the majority uh, consent of, of our customer base. That's the luxury now having been in this business long enough. I don't have to guess what people want. Um, I, I get to hear what people want, and that's tremendous competitive advantage. Um, so here's something that Eric and I have been going back and forth on, and, and I don't want any immediate answers now. Please email me at adam at indicatorwarehouse.com. But... Um, the, the question on the table that I'm wrestling with is, if you had a choice between, and it's not an either, it's not a, a both, it's an either or. If you had a choice between Eric doing the format that he does today, which I consider more of a training or educational format in the trade room, or a traditional call room, which would you prefer? Now, before you answer that, let me just give you some of my view on this. And that you may not have thought about because I know the immediate reaction is call room, call room, call room. Um, it, it is my belief, and I'm waiting for someone to prove me wrong, that anyone, anyone who's trading a live room and claims to be trading with a truly live account, like their own money at risk, uh, is lying, quite frankly. And I'll tell you why. Uh, my background is in education and teaching. I, in fact, I, you can tell I love to talk. And in my opinion, Teaching is an outward experience. I have knowledge. I'm trying to convey it outward to the audience so that we connect, right? And Eric's incredibly gifted at this. Trading, on the other hand, is an inward experience. 
you're highly focused on your charts, your own emotions, yourself. It's a very personal experience. And the reason I'm sharing this is, if Eric has real money on the line, namely my money, then it's going to be a rather quiet room. Okay? I mean, th there will be like, okay, I'm about to take a trade, but the last thing he's going to be doing is fielding a bunch of questions. And, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Imagine right now you're Eric, and you're in your room, and you're trading, and you've got 50, 100 people asking you questions while you're trying to make money. Would you be successful? And so also imagine that you have to talk out loud what you're doing while you're doing it. And I don't mean cursing at the screen. Would you be successful? Well, that's what it takes to be a trade room moderator. And so, yes, do we trade on a SIM account in a live environment? Absolutely. In fact, we don't hide it because this is an educational environment in which our objective is for you to take advantage of this education so that you can capitalize on the investment. To, it, I recognize it was a big investment to buy into Raptor and or DTS. And so I felt as a business owner obligated to enable my customers to use the software because my assumption, correct me if I'm wrong, is we're all in this to get out of the room and be self-directed independent traders. Whereas a call room, in my opinion, fosters a sense of sucking from the teat for the rest of your life. Anyways. Man, I'm just full of soapboxes today. Um, that's yes, what I want you, you all to think. Right. That's what I want you all to think about. That's probably why you don't let me on here too much. That's why I want you to think about it because it's a big deal. I mean, yes, would our marketing and sales skyrocket if we were out there saying live call room free forever? <laughs> you know, with no cost associated after you buy the system. You bet. Uh, I mean, that's like. That's, that's, that's whatever. And I'm very confident that Eric could do that. I'm very confident that Eric can make money with a live account. We've proven that in the past. Again, the question is what is the, what is the value or what is the venue for this room for our customers? And I would love for you to take some time and let that sink in and, and write me an email at adamandindicatorwarehouse.com and give me your opinion. Yeah, because after all, that's, that's why I'm here. I'm here to help help you guys learn yep. how to use your, your software and hopefully highlight a couple of good trades in the process. Uh, William was asking why his gold chart looks so different than mine. Uh, gold I actually have uh, on the alternate settings. Now, for those of you who haven't heard about this before, there's a couple of markets that don't look right with the default settings. The E-mini S&P being the most... Um, popular one. Now what happens if you put the stock settings on the E-mini S&P is that your your daybreak lines look something like this and you're not getting enough data uh, developing within each day to get an adequate amount of signals. So if that's what your chart looks like then what you need to do is you need to try the alternate settings. And the alternate settings are four ticks for the hawk four ticks for the falcon, six ticks for the eagle. Now the easy way to remember that is that's the phone exchange for Moose Jaw Saskatchewan, just in case you were wondering. But um, the alternate settings, I have them on gold. Gold is actually a large enough market. I could go with the stock settings, but uh, traditionally the markets that are trading at 1250 a tick, so that means like the E-mini S&P, Whenever we're watching soybeans or wheat, I'll go to the alternate settings, and the only reason is that there's not enough data coming through. But you can see gold. Um, I could certainly go with the stock settings on gold. I just happen to have it on the alternate setting chart. It doesn't mean that you're not going to uh, – you can't trade gold off the stock settings, off the default settings. Uh, but with the – alternate settings, you are going to produce a few more signals, which is not always a good thing. Um, sometimes, you know, we just want to get the uh, the quality signal and not worry about the quantity. So I'm sorry if I confused you there, but yeah, that's what's going on with the, with the gold chart. So it looks like we're going to try maybe to make another press lower here, in which case I'll start rolling that stop down. But uh, right now, gold's still kind of sideways. 
And the NASDAQ struggling to get a little bit higher, but holding its own. So you see the, the volume that went through on this bar down here on the Eagle, right here at this 4503 area, that primary resistance line that we know of. A lot of buying and selling going on there. Looks like the buyers won that bar, and they won the bar after that. And now the sellers are starting to gang up on them a little bit. All right. Well, still no... No decent signal to the short side. We did see a couple signals, though. We did get the uh, first micro-macro cross here on the Hawk. So a nice little uptick there to the top end of the range. And we are working a trend change signal. You know what? I'm going to... Oh, shoot. It's going to run away on me. Maybe we'll try it here on the Raptor. And... So what we've got is we've got um, essentially just a continuation signal here on the Raptor. And I'm going to see if it doesn't, no, it's not going to move down. Doggone it. I was going to try to let the signal retreat a little bit, and I was just going to hop in with a buy order. But it's not going to give me that chance. Oh, well. The other well, thing, when you you're in a trading that, range, right? of course... Pardon, Adam? Thank oh. you for saying Raptor, because that was my second question, and it was a wonderful lead-in. So rumor has it you folks are using uh, the cloud in a different way than at least I originally designed it. Um, when you have a minute, when there's some downtime, would you demonstrate that for me? Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the Raptor, we've got the double cloud, and I've mentioned this to Ben that maybe he wants to uh, set this as the default. And you can blame Ricardo for this. This wasn't my doing. <laughs> Ricardo, <laughs> really? Yeah, this is, is from still, Ricardo is from the. the room? Uh, this is from the Raptor forum. Oh, interesting! Wow. Okay. Yeah, and it um, it has it R has Ricardo Ricardo the 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 consummate and ongoing tweaker and and tester. That's the guy. Mm hmm. <laughs> oh, that's the yeah. It's fantastic. Hey, you know what? Again, as a software designer you know, we put this thing out there, but it's a tool, and uh, the beautiful thing about having a community is you folks find better ways to use it, and, and thank you. So that's, I'm, I'm intrigued to see, uh, see what y'all have done. Okay, I was just going to point out here, when you're in a trading range, uh, the, the safest plan of action is, oops, is to let the market break out of the trading range and then look for that retest. Once you get that retest, see if the market doesn't come back and produce another signal. That's going to be the high probability signal that you can take. Even though it looks like the market may be topping out, you might be looking at it and say, oh, I can't buy. What if I hit the resistance here and the market goes down? No, you got to focus on the higher support. you got to focus on the fact that you broke out and the market came back. It looks like the buyers are holding that area where they broke out from and go ahead, give it, a, give it a whirl, try to buy it up. Okay, so for those of you who only have the single cloud on your Raptor, this is how you can fix that. So you go to your, indi you go to your indicator panel, and you scroll down here, and you find where it says IW Raptor Cloud. Where are you? Here we are. Maybe Eagle Cloud. Oh, okay. There it is. IWRTS Raptor Cloud. So if you double click on that, you're going to find that you have two Raptor Clouds in your assortment. So the first cloud I changed to a brick size of eight. Raptor Cloud size of eight. The second cloud, uh, just leave with the default value of 12. But we need to change the color, otherwise you're going to have two 
bands the same color and you're not going to know which one's which. So choose whatever color you like. I chose cornflower blue because it's pretty. And then you also need to change the, the hard edge color. And again, you can choose any color you like, so long as it's not this, the same value as the other cloud. And then you can apply those, and voila, you have a double cloud. Now, the reason Ricardo did this when he was uh, playing with his Raptor tool is he found that sometimes he was getting these hard edge bounces a little bit early, and sometimes the hard edge bounce would come a little bit late. And that's why he doubled up on the cloud for the Raptor. And there you go. Now we have this awesome so, so is, double is, cloud. Is the principle of the hard edge bounce still valid? It's just there are two opportunities now for a hard edge bounce? Uh, yes. Uh, you've, okay. got the, you've got the two zones that we're watching. And uh, it also gives us a, a great little signal um, that we refer to as the cloud crossover. I got to go back here a little ways to find you one. Uh, come on. Well, this isn't textbook, but I guess it'll do. So the the bands are obviously bullish here. Then they start to cross over and they become bearish. When the band crosses over, we look for the market to retreat into the band and the band to offer some sort of resistance. And then we're going to look for a signal to generate out of that. That tends to be a very okay. high probability signal. So that the band crossover or the cloud crossover tends to have pretty good follow through. Uh, let me see if I can find you here. Well, no, that one didn't work. Hold on. Sorry, I'm going to make everybody dizzy here, but let me find a good one. Here we go. So we go from an obviously bearish market. The clouds cross right. over. Now we're looking for the band to offer some sort of support as the market retreats into the band. And then we come out, and there we produce our buy signal. So this is our cloud crossover signal, and it tends to be a high probability signal. This guy right here. And then we get our... I love that. Yeah. It, it works really well. You know, traditionally in the past, the Japanese have always copied our engineering. So now we get revenge, and we get to copy theirs, and it's a better Ichimoku cloud. <laughs> That's American ingenuity right there. Pardon me, North American. Sorry, Eric. I apologize. North American. Yeah. Okay. Got it. You know what, do me a favor, in your copious spare time, if you would make a short video of what you just told me, I'll get it out on our YouTube channel, so, you know, sure. or at least in the training part, so that you don't have to keep answering that question over and over again. Mm -hmm. And like I said, maybe Ben just wants to uh, change it so that it, it rolls out of the, comes out of the box that way. Yep, point taken. Okay. Uh, well, see, yeah, folks, now, you, now you get to see how things are really working, right? This is... You know the old saying, you don't want to see how sausage is made or, or advertising? Same thing, right? It's messy on the back end. But uh, anyway, just teasing. Um, William's asking about the DTS form, uh, the Facebook form. I'll let you address that, Adam, because you know all the addresses and whatnot. Sure. Um, I, William, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm, I don't see the question box. Just email me and tell me what you want to get into or need to get into, and I'll send you the link and access and all that stuff. Okay. So... Anybody, if you're not on the, we have two Facebook forums. There's the DTS forum and the Raptor forum. And uh, the idea is just that DTS owners and Raptor owners get together and they share some ideas. They say, hey, you know, I find this works or what do you think of this? I've been testing that and, and so on. It's a, like Adam says, a great place to share ideas. The Raptor is the most tweakable of the tools. The other tools are the programming is locked. The Raptor does have some uh, tweakability to it, which is how that whole double cloud scenario came about. Got it. Yeah, uh, as a software designer, it's always a it's a slippery slope because you want to give people the flexibility to adapt the tools to their own style. On the other hand, you don't want them to break the core um, algorithmic or whatever the core intelli intelligence or. Uh, that's gone into it that's made it valuable in the first place. So 
It's always a trade-off. Yeah, uh, Glenn's got a question here about the alternate settings on the Hawk, Falcon, and Eagle for the S&P. Do you have a suggestion for the Raptor S&P? Hold on, I'm just loading the S&P onto uh, a Raptor chart, and I'll pull that over here so we can take a look at it. And uh, just waiting for that retest now of that breakout before we take a look at another signal. I think we're going to be getting that shortly. Ideally, a macro pullback signal here on the Hawk. Um, a trend line touch, or maybe even a late filter entry signal in the Falcon, and uh, perhaps a, a, a hard edge bounce here on the Raptor. All right, so here's the E-mini S&P on the Raptor, and you can see what I mean about the daybreak lines. Right, these are, this is yesterday. This is all of yesterday's range. This is all of the day before. This is all of the day before that. So you can see, unless you happen to catch this signal here at 2.21 Pacific AM, you didn't generate another signal the whole day. So if this is what your chart looks like, this is time for you to try the alternate settings. And like I say, unfortunately, the E-mini S&P, one of the world's most popular markets, has to be the odd man out from the default settings. So go to your data series and um, try the alternate setting. Uh, we'll dial it down, say, we'll try the six tick brick first. And I'm going to show you what you want to look for here. So you can judge whether or not uh, the brick size is the right size. So notice our, our lines have expanded somewhat. We're starting to generate a few more signals. This could just be a quiet day. Ideally, I want to see the, the whole session span at least the width of my monitor. So let's see the, the next day. Okay, that's not bad. It's borderline. Let's see the day before that. Okay, still not bad. So now what I start looking at is I start looking at, okay, what kind of signals what, uh, were we printing? Did I get any trading opportunities and what were the, was the follow-through like? It's a little bit of a balancing act between finding um, an adequate number of signals and going too far and having too many signals. Because remember, we're not about signal generation. We're about finding high probability signals. And the Raptor, in particular, has been designed to choose quality over quantity. So we don't want to go so far along that we're producing signals every few bars, and the chop is just so annoying that we can't uh, ride out any swings. All right? So here the market opened this particular day. We generated a signal. That's great. An hour later generated another signal. Now this was an exceptionally strong day. So let's go to the day after. Market opened, generated a signal. Okay, decent follow through there. And uh, that was pretty much it. Now you're going to notice our bands are getting huge here. So I think we're also going to have to adjust the band size, in which case we go now to the indicator window. And let's, I normally dial them down a couple of ticks to start. So if I go now to the Raptor, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the Raptor to paint the same way as this would look on, say, uh, if we were trading the NASDAQ or if we were trading gold or crude. You know, we don't want this chart to look any different. In fact, you want to be able to look at the chart and not really recognize the market that you're trading. Okay, so it's better, but the band still a little bit big. You see how we're, we're missing these hard edge bounces here? So let's dial it down a couple more ticks. So we'll go from six ticks to four and on the other band we'll go to where did you go raptor cloud we'll go down to eight and like i say with the other tools you don't do any of this this is very much just uh, specific to the raptor 
Okay, that's starting to look a little bit more familiar, isn't it? And you can see we're getting some decent hard edge bounces. What you want is you want to have the confidence that when you see the signal, when you see the cloud crossover, when you see the signal, that you can say, yeah, okay, I recognize that signal. I can take that. I know that's a high probability trade. And what you do now is you just scroll back through your chart for a few days and you follow the signals and you say, you see how the signal follows through. If it looks like it follows through correctly, then you found your settings. So with the, uh, with the ES, it looks like you could go to a four tick brick. I'll show you the four tick. And four ticks on the ES is actually a natural number because there are four ticks per point in the E-mini. So to answer your question, Glenn, I'd probably gravitate toward the four ticks. And you're going to see, so here's our daybreak line now. And you see we're going at least the width of the, of the monitor, which is, I think, is ideal. So there's the daybreak line again. And now we're going at least the width of the monitor. So I, I would suggest a four tick brick on the E-mini. And now we need to, once again, adjust our clouds. So, and we're just trying to get it to look normal at this point. And like I say, if you don't know what normal is supposed to look like, uh, look at a uh, look at a uh, crude oil chart or a Nasdaq chart. Okay, that one band is too narrow. What was my other one? Uh, six ticks. Okay, that might work. So it looks like, there we go. So we've got our four tick brick, our four tick and six tick clouds. And uh, that looks like it's pretty much bang on for trading the E-mini on the Raptor. And you can see the whole process not very involved. Um, and all you're doing is you're building your chart so that it looks like this chart. See? They, well, they're a little bit different because, of course, it's the E-mini against the NASDAQ. But looking at the chart, it looks very similar, doesn't it? Right? And that's all you're after. So once again, I would go with a four-tick brick and then a four and six tick cloud. And I think you'll I think you'll be satisfied with those results. All right, while that was going on, uh, gold fell off here a little bit, found our profit target on our uh, Falcon signal here. So the signal that generated back here, we took a little bit of heat on. Uh, our stops were above the median line right above here, and then the market finally decided to see things our way, and prices fell off sharply and hit our profit objective. This one was a little bit easier to take in the sense that it was with trend, and let me pull over the eagle chart here. As I mentioned to you before, it's a good idea not to trade in a vacuum. You know, don't just focus on the last three bars, three or four bars that are going on here. Oh, I get a buy signal. I buy. No, no, no. You got to look at the whole uh, context, right? Look at what's come before. Well, we're in a downtrend. Um, market's gone a little bit sideways, a little bit consolidation, but we're still kind of in a downtrend. We won't officially be in an uptrend until the market does one of these gives us a higher high and a higher low. Now we're in an uptrend. And if you don't know which way the market is trending, go grab an eight-year-old and sit him down and say, which way is this going? <laughs> Up, down, or sideways? And a kid will be able to tell you it's going down. 
Yes, it can be that simple. Try not to, to make it more difficult than it needs to be. All right. Uh, just checking, making sure I haven't missed anybody's questions. All right, folks, as enthralling as this is, um, I do have to keep running our business to keep it alive. So um, anything for me before I go, again, you're always welcome to email me. And you know, if you want to talk, you know, I have my little link to set up a conference call. I'm happy to do that. So anything while you have me on the spot. Uh, Alejandro has a question about uh, the Eagle Cloud Indicator. He says he's got the DTS system. But Alejandro, I think that's best if you just shoot uh, Adam an email about that and ask him what you, you're you looking for there. And I'll type in Adam's email so everybody can s spam him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's Adam's email for everybody. And seriously, uh Eric, just make yourself a note, please. I mean, there, there's some really l great little tidbits that you dropped today, particularly around the cloud, um, you know, or any alternate settings. I think you have a cheat sheet, if I remember correctly, but if not, you know, aggregate this all together, and I'll put it to, you know, I'll make it look nice and get it out to the to our customers. Mm -hmm. Will do. All right, folks. Um, it was fun. I hope, I hope you all got some value out of, you know, me being here today. If not anything, uh, you got to hear me rant. And uh, have a great weekend um, for those in the U.S. Have a nice Memorial Day, and um, we will catch you on the flip side. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Talk to you later, Adam. I will now try and leave without canceling the session, which may be tricky. All right, here we go. <laughs> yeah, okay. If, if the room shuts down, we'll just call it a day. <laughs> Adam, close the room. Nope. All right, so far so good. Okay, well, uh, still not much going on, but that was kind of what we suspected. It looks like the NQ tailed off here a little bit as the buyers walked away. So here was the top end of this trading range. Came down. There was no support here. And now we've drifted back deep into the trading range. Um, I think we're just going to be stuck sideways. We did produce a first micro macro cross. This one would have been a little bit tricky to take uh, because we don't really have a retest of the extreme, right? We don't have a retest of the high. You could take it. You'd probably have to cover the trade up here, however. Now we're into yellow bars, so I can nix this signal. But if the market is going to continue lower, we should produce another scalp signal here. But overall, the market is very, very sideways. But like I've been saying, it's kind of to be anticipated. Uh, we'll stay with it a few more minutes. Um, We'll hang out for maybe another 10, 15 minutes, see if things start to loosen up. Otherwise, I think we'll call it an early weekend also. Oh, Floyd says Yellen is speaking this afternoon. And you're right about the day range or the range being very low today. Today's range only at 84 ticks, yesterday at 128. Um, and the 30 and 10 day averages both up around 200, 230. So traders not willing to commit too much before the weekend.
Do, do, do. Getting a red bar buy signal. It's against the ATR. Um, we should see a little bit of an uptick here. Uh, certainly, I could see a retest of the high around 4508 being very plausible. Not enough here for me to... Hmm. Well, this is one of these trades where it's looking a little dicey. The momentum is off. Uh, this is probably not a trade I would get too excited about. There's very little follow-through, either higher or lower at this point. Uh, I'm going to point this out just because there's nothing going on, but we're we're getting a buy signal here. It is a red bar buy, but it's the signal is against the ATR, right? When it prints this way, it's against the ATR. Sometimes I will take the signal early, but very often I want it to be in sync with the ATR. So what that means is I actually let the ATR flip over. Now I can tell you from, from this bar right here, if it closes on the high, it will trade past the ATR and it will flip the ATR over. So this next bar effectively becomes our signal bar. So you could look to buy above there. Ooh, can't cover down there. That's too far. Oh, darn it. I should have mentioned to Adam. Oh, see, I got it set at 1% and I can't, I can't get the trade to fly there. I should have mentioned to Adam about changing those colors on those two buttons. Why? Why? Why did they have to put two blue buttons next to each other? How many times have I, in the heat of the moment, hit the wrong color button? Or the wrong button. The right color. Wrong button. Now, what I would suggest here is I would not suggest the full uh, profit objective. In fact, if this market slips back just a little bit. I'm going to tighten the profit target. There we go. Uh, William asks, can you adjust the colors on the ATR? I, I don't know. ATR trail. No, not really. You can, you can adjust one color. I don't know if that's going to change both. That's a good question. I never tried. Oh. Uh, William says mine look brighter. I do adjust some of the colors, like the um, the Falcon... Uh, originally came out with a fuchsia line and the dots were different colors than the bars. I think now everything is red, 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 which is, you know, whatever, it's fine. But the colors are one thing that you can definitely tweak on your system. So I've changed my colors to lime and magenta, if anybody's curious. And I think I went to tomato, no, light coral. just to give it a different look. Okay, the Geiger counter showing some pretty serious order. There was some serious buying. There it is. Hold on. There it is. Come on. So we'll see if that follows through now and actually produces a buy signal on the eagle here. Not going to get too crazy about it.
even though it technically it's a high probability signal my stops are pretty tight I would much rather have my stops down here give myself some room to play in All right, there we go. So you see how the bar closed on the high. The ATR now flipped over. So everything is in sync. And what I'll do is I'll bring my break even trigger down here. So once we're about three quarters of the way to the target, we'll get this trade into a break-even situation. <clears throat> if we manage to get three quarters of the way to the target. I do have the brightness up a little bit on my monitor as well. That might uh, make the lines stand out a little bit more. Come on. At least expect 4508. Where's our support and resistance suite? 4511 half. That's the resistance line. You can see we tagged it almost right to the number. green now it's trying to get a little bit more of a bearish flavor going Didn't expect it to flinch right at 4506. The unfortunate part about this trade is if it tries to turn here, it's going to look very much like a um, test to the extreme. In which case the market may try to retreat back to the trend line and maybe even violate the trend line.
Come on. Let's go. Haven't got all day. Well, actually I do, but <laughs> I don't want to spend all day here. Come on, let's go. I got things to do. All right, well, this isn't looking all that promising, but we figured as much. <laughs> yeah, William asked, does your wife have your weekend book? You have no idea. <laughs> uh, doing something tonight, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Oh, gosh, I was looking forward to a quiet weekend. Well, as we get closer to the uh, lunch hour, and I suspect the afternoon will be dismal, as in dead, uh, we can anticipate more of this sideways, stagnant trading. I'm debating putting my stops in right here below this bar. See the one with this tail? That's the one where the sellers tried to knock it down. The buyers stepped up at around 4,500, pushed the market a little bit higher. Uh, this is the more fundamentally sound stop down here. So I guess I'll leave it there. And I'll just try to nurse this one up, see if we can't get it at least to the break-even trigger and up to the uh, profit target. And, uh, yeah, William, I think you got the right idea. I think we're going to um, wrap up the room, call it a day, call it an early weekend, uh, because I suspect a lot of other traders are doing the exact same thing. Look at, since the open barely produced 20 bars, so it's a very, very quiet day. All right, you guys and girls, have yourselves a very nice holiday weekend. I will see you on Tuesday, and uh, we'll get back at it. Tuesday should be a busy day. There will be lots for the market to react to. All right, we'll talk to you then. Bye for now.